Good morning, everybody. And welcome to the Foundry. Uh, my name is Isaac. It's good to see you guys gathered together here with us. We're so glad that you can be joining us um, this Sunday. And those of you joining us for any of our online broadcasts, we're glad that you can be participating with us as well. And our call to worship this morning is going to come out of the book of Ephesians. And uh, I love the book of Ephesians because it seems like this group of people knows how to live. They have heard the good news, they have accepted the good news, they have trusted the good news, and they are actively seeking God. And it's great that already we can have an example of people like this. And this is some advice that the Apostle Paul, who's writing this letter to them, gives them. He says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Will you join us in a word of prayer? Lord, we want to be wise. We don't want to walk in foolishness and darkness. We want to make the best use of our time. We want to honor you with our time, and we want to love our brothers and sisters with our time. Help us not to walk in that foolishness and darkness, but help us to choose you and to choose your wisdom and to choose and embrace your plan for our life. We thank you that you came and you showed us the way and that you taught us the way. So Lord, help us to walk in that way and follow your paths. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. In my fourth man in the fire, time after time, born of his spirit, washed in his blood, and what he did for me on Calvary is more than. Oh, I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Perfect submission, all is at
Jesus tells us that if we seek him, we will find him. Let's sing it out that I sought the Lord. Oh, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard. Amen. I invite you to stay standing this morning, find someone to say hello to, and maybe share what's a great piece of advice you have received sometime in your life. Go and greet one another this morning.
mostly pray for those prayer requests. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm going to ask you, please fill those connection cards. We want to pray for you. We want to get to know you. Um, and welcome again to the Founder Community Church. We have a few events um, in June. Um, I want to start by reminding you about our prayer Sundays for Foster the City. Every Sunday of June, starting at 10 a.m., um, we're going to gather here in the sanctuary to pray, to pray for this organization, to pray for youth and children in the foster si uh, system in the San Diego County. So I, if, if that's something that really uh, touches your heart, and even if, if, if it doesn't, but you are really intrigued about, about what that means, just please come. Some of you already are here, so might as well pray, you know. <laughs> so every Sunday of June at 10 a.m., we're going to gather to pray for Foster the City. Amen? June 11th, we have the Women's Fellowship. Who's excited about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So it's going to be June 11th, a games, ice cream, elotes, and games. So even if you're new, I really, I really hope you can join us um, for that Women's Fellowship at 630. Um, if you are interested in going, just contact me or Jess and we can put you down in the list, and we're going to have such a fun time. It's just going to be a time of fellowship and womanhood. <laughs> so come to that. And we also, I want to remind you also of our recurring meetings. This month of May will be the last month of life groups. So um, we have three, th uh, three different meetings of life groups. The Oceanside one is taking a rest. Um, for a family situation, but the other two are still active. So if you're interested in community, we always say Sunday is not enough. I'm going to keep repeating that until everybody says Sunday is not enough. Amen. <laughs> Sunday is not enough, so community happens after Sunday, Monday through, Friday, through Saturday. So come, choose a life group. We want to get to know you and pray with you and read scripture with you. And we also have our recovery meetings four times a week. In your bulletins, you will have more information about those uh, meetings. Um, and that's it. I think I covered everything. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to invite you to stand again with us. We're going to sing some more songs of uh, worship and praise as we draw close to the Lord and uh, focus on seeking him and wisdom from him today. So let's stand and sing together.
can change and hold me down. You are here right now. Victory is breaking down. Right here, right now. You are with me. You are for me. You'll never leave. You are with me. You are for me. You'll never leave. God says that he will never leave us or forsake us. And we've been focusing on the book of Ecclesiastes this month, and in chapter 3, a very famous chapter, we hear that to everything there's a season, to everything there is an appointed time. Things like mourning and dancing and grieving and joy, building and tearing down, all these things are part of God's design. They are part of what he has in store for us. And at the conclusion of that section, it says that God makes all things beautiful in his time. And we can't really picture that. We're just little, small, tiny, short-lived beings and he's from everlasting to everlasting. But in his time, all those things that we can't see now, that right now when we even try, it just looks like a poor reflection in a mirror. We can't see it. But in his time, he makes all things beautiful. And so we're going to sing this song today, honoring God and his wisdom and his timing.
scripture we hear that if we seek wisdom from above that God is going to richly bestow it on us Jesus tells us that we need to seek him and we will find him that if we knock on the doors to the kingdom of heaven they will be open for us and all the richness of all the blessings that God has in store for us that can be so hard to see at times and so hard for us to understand all that wisdom that comes from above we will find him if we seek him so Lord we ask help us to seek you and your wisdom today we know that you are good and faithful to honor that you will meet us right there and that we will find you. Let's sing, The More I See.
love is so deep, it's more than I can stand. I'm melting your peace, it's overwhelming. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back again. I invite you to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are truly blessed because you're a God who promises that when we draw near to you, you draw near to us. It doesn't matter how messy and how of a mess our life is. When we come to you, you don't run away from us. You run towards us. And you embrace your arms around us. You love us, you forgive us, you lift us up, you believe in us, you trust us, you care for us, you like us. Father, why would we not want to come to your presence? When every time we come, we find life. And I just pray, Lord, that we would see that today. That all the things that pull us away from a from you, that we would leave aside and wholeheartedly, Lord God, desire and long for to be by your side. And I just pray, Lord, that your presence may be with those who are not with us this morning, whether they're home, whether they're in a different city, Lord God, may your comforting love give them peace. And may your comforting love also, Lord God, have mercy and heal those who are ill. Give strength to those who are weak. And lift up their face of those who are downcast. Father God, I pray for your miracles today. You're a God of miracles. And we pray about it and we sing about it every day. And I pray for miracles, Lord God. We thank you for this opportunity where we can do church together. Where we can come to you and give you all the praise and all the honor with our worship, with our tithes and offerings, with our lives, with our will, with our surrendering. So we surrender it all to you this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may take your seat. Before the children are dismissed, um, I do want the children to know and celebrate. So most of you know that yesterday was our annual conference. So as a conference, as a free Methodist church, we get together and we celebrate new incoming leaders. We celebrate what God has done throughout the year. But one of the things that we were able to share in celebration is that Amy is officially a conference ministerial candidate. Woohoo! So you can stand up, Amy, so everyone knows. Yeah. So that means, thank you, Amy, um, that she has said yes to the calling that God has placed in her heart 
to serve God as an ordained elder. And so that is a track that she is in. And we are here to support you, and we are here to walk with you, and we are here to cheer for you and pray for you. So we're so grateful and privileged to have you with us. With that said, children, you are welcome to join uh, Ms. Gretchen and Ms. Annie, I believe, downstairs for your Sunday school, or you're welcome to stay here with us. And one last thing before we go on is next Sunday, we're going to have Baptism Sunday. Woohoo! Are you excited? Yeah. So if you have not been baptized and would like to, this is your opportunity. But it's not the last one, right? Baptism is not my program. It's not a church program, right? It's your decision. And we are simply there to facilitate and so here just happens to be an opportunity. And if you want to join that celebration that Sunday, you're more than welcome to join us. If you are interested, please reach out to me or re um, let us know in the connection card, and we will follow up with you. So excited for next Sunday. We continue with our series on Ecclesiastes, a very interesting book, right? <laughs> There's so much to learn from that book, and we're just barely scratching the surface. So I'm trying to think, okay, if I were to pick four topics, because that's all we have in the month of May, right, for Sundays, what would I pick? And so one that I cannot just let go is this idea of wisdom in Ecclesiastes, right? Choosing wisdom. Choosing wisdom. Do you know, on average, how many choices an adult makes a day? A lot? Okay, a number. Guess a number. Poof, nope. Not even close. Closer? Closer? <laughs> About 33,000 choices. Right? And, and you would wonder, it's like, okay, who kept track of that? Like, how do you know? Like, someone's just, okay, I just made a choice, click. Another choice, click. Another choice. <laughs> like, but you kind of understand, you kind of figure right? A child, on average, do you know how many choices they make? <laughs> no, less than that. Yes. 300? Multiply that times 10. 3,000, good job, right? About 3,000. 3,000 compared to 33,000. That's like, wow, that is a huge difference. And I mean, this is just something that you just have to Google, right? It's not scientific or it's not something that I came up with. But I just thought, oh, I wonder what kind of fun facts I can find. But it made sense. Even just driving. In the span of driving you from one place to another place, you make a lot of choices. When to press the brake, how fast to go, turn left or turn right, or how, when to speed, right? So in, in just an hour of driving, you're probably making over, you know, 2,000 choices just that. And how many of you count your steps, right? So if you made 10,000 steps, that's 10,000 choices. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like left foot, right foot, left foot. But there, there's so much because we have so much responsibility. A child, it makes sense. It's like they don't worry about anything. They just live freely. And we often remind our kids who on average make 3,000 choices, remember to make good choices, right? How many of you have heard that or <laughs> have told your kids, remember to make good choices, right? And we're the ones that makes 33,000 choices. Does anyone remind us to make good choices? And when we talk to kids about making good choices, Micah knows because I tell him all the time, was that a good choice or was that a bad choice? He's like, bad choice. All right, then next time make a good choice. The point is that when we're trying to teach children how to make good choices, right, we need to define good for them. We need to let them know what is the difference between right and wrong. Their worldview has to be shaped and formed. We need to inform what right and wrong is. Because in that stage of life, in their stage of life, um, it's all about them, right? And that's what a child does. It's all about me. So most of the choices that they're going to make is, is it good for me? Yes. Ah, then it's a good choice, right? <laughs> but as we grow older, we know that no, not every good choice, not every choice that we make it all about us ends up being a good 
choice. So as we grow older, the choices we make become more complex. They, co they become more difficult. They become less selfish. And hopefully it revolves more around what is morally and ethically right. But even for adults, these choices can still be complex. They can still be challenging because we don't know. We don't know a lot of things. The funny thing about time is it allows us to know yesterday and today. But time doesn't let you know what tomorrow is. As far as tomorrow goes, there's a lot of unknown. You can predict at best, but there's a lot of unknown. There's a lot of known from the past because we know, call it history and we learn from it. There's a lot I can know about the present because I know what I see, I know what I feel, I know what I have. But there is so much unknown about tomorrow. And we have to make decisions as adults, not only based on yesterday, not only based on today, but now we have to make decisions based on what? Tomorrow. And it becomes difficult because tomorrow is not known. It's uncertain. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example, right? Saving money. How many of you save money? I, actually, don't raise your hand. <laughs> saving money, right? We've often made choices, right? Okay, is this a good time to save money or to splurge? Right? How many of you have made or struggled with those choices, right? Okay, should I save money or should I splurge? I don't know if I'll ever live to enjoy my savings. We work so hard for retirement, but there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee that I'm going to live to 65 and, and retire. There's no guarantee that I'm even, even going to get to retire <laughs> at 65, I'm hoping. Um, but you don't know. You do know today, right? And then there's the possibility that what I have might not be there tomorrow. What I have today might not be there tomorrow. So should I save or should I splurge? So then wisdom comes along. Wisdom doesn't predict the future. It does, however, take knowledge I may not have yet, experiences I haven't lived through yet, but others have, and with bright neon lights, right, points us to the right direction. And it says this would be <clears throat> the wisest reality. Not because of the ability to predict the future, but because of what God knows and because of what he has revealed and because of what people have lived through and what people have experienced, right? This would be the wisest thing to do. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 5 and 8 tells us this. It says, whoever keeps a command will meet no harm. And the wise heart knows the right time and the right way. Because there is a right time and the right way for every matter. Even what we're talking about, saving. But human misfortunes are overwhelming because no one knows what will happen. And no one can say when something might happen. No one has control over the life breath to retain it. And there is no control over the day of death. Therefore, says the author, the uncertainty of tomorrow doesn't or shouldn't really hinder you from making a wise choice. It doesn't affect it. Quite contrary, it leads us to actually seek more wisdom because of the unknown. Wisdom will also paint what it will look like if we ignore it. So in Proverbs 21.20, it says, Precious treasure and oil stay in the home of the wise but fools swallow them up. So, in essence, yeah, do save some. Don't waste it all. Be wise. Make the right choice. But wisdom goes deeper because it's not just about the external things around me. It's also about what? My heart. So if we go deeper with this example, 
then when we read <coughs> in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, it points out the fact that we don't save money to the point that we utterly depend on it. That, would be not, that wouldn't be the right motive or live for it and become so enslaved by money that there is no room for goodness and generosity. And so it warns us. It says, tell people who are rich at this time not to become egotistical and not to place their hope on their finances, which are uncertain. Instead, they need to hope in God who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. Tell them to do good, to be rich in the good things they do, to be generous and to share with others. When they do these things, they will save a treasure for themselves that is a good foundation for the future. That way, they can take hold of what is truly life. Of what is truly life. Ecclesiastes is all about that. What is truly life. As someone who has saved enough, right? This is King Solomon, right? He doesn't have to worry about having enough at the end of his life. He's got more than enough. As someone who has saved enough to live wealthy even to his last day, enjoyed every pleasure life can offer under the sun, none satisfied him in the end, after all. And the book of Ecclesiastes might seem like it, but it is not to convince you that life is meaningless, even though it tells you 38 times, right? Meaningless, 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 meaningless. The book of Ecclesiastes is not an excuse also to live a nonchalant life. Oh, since everything is meaningless, then who cares how I live? The book of Ecclesiastes is about a teacher who, through what seems like a monologue, shares with those interested in finding meaning his own search for wisdom, for what is right, for what is truly life. No matter how hard he tried, you see, and how much power and money he had, when it came down to wisdom, it always led to God. Wisdom culminated with God. Wisdom revolved around God. So we read this in Ecclesiastes 7, 13 through 18. He says this, Consider God's work. Who can strain what God has made crooked? When times are good, enjoy the good. When times are bad, Consider, God has made the former as well as the latter so that people can't discover anything that will come to be after them. I have seen everything in my pointless lifetime. The righteous person may die in spite of their righteousness. Then again, the wicked may live long in spite of their wickedness. Don't be too righteous or too wise, or you may be dumbfounded. Don't be too wicked. And don't be a fool, or you may die before your time. It's good that you take hold of one of these without letting go of the other, because the one who fears God will go forth with both. Interesting saying. The author is not trying to place blame on God for the good and the bad. Wisdom calls for a humble recognition that God works in mysterious ways. Wisdom calls for a humble recognition of our own limitations. What we see as bad happening in our world or what we see as good happening in our world, at the end of the day, we come with this recognition that I am not able to control any of that. And in my knowledge and my limited knowledge, there is much that I cannot understand. God has no limitations, but we do we do we have many and often we end up defying and fighting those limitations by going to an extreme take athletes for example right they are constantly pushing what their limits to be faster or to be stronger or to be more skilled in in whatever uh, discipline they are at if someone tells them hey you cannot run faster than this Oh, yeah? Watch me, right? And they challenge themselves, and they push the limits because they want to be the fastest. And there's this race to be the one that broke those limits. Even righteousness says, 
the teacher. To an extreme can become so presumptuous and self-righteous that you become no different than a foolish person. Seek righteousness too far, and you might just think to yourself, oh, look how righteous I am. So that isn't good either, right? Seek foolishness too much, well then, life ends short for you. So the author concludes, then what is life? What is left for us? What is truly life? And this is where he goes back again, fear God. Fear God. Proverbs 9, 10, 11, most of you know this, it's from the same author. And this is what it says about fear. It says, the beginning of wisdom is a fear of the Lord. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Through me, your days will be many. Years will be added to your life. Fear is this divine reverence, respect, that leads us to an awareness of our limitations. Fear allows me to respect God in the sense that, God, you know everything, I know nothing. <laughs> God, I am limited, you are unlimited. God, I cannot control anything, you control everything. And prompts us to lean into God's limitless knowledge and understanding. I fear God because what I know or think I know doesn't even come close to what God knows. Yet, it, in God's vast knowledge, and despite our limitations, God decides to make His love known to us. And that's the beauty of it, right? God makes known to us how much He is for us and not against us. God makes known to us His power over death, over sin, over evil. God makes known to us that time is in His hands. It's like this, everything I know I, that is important, I let you know so that what? You would fear me. Not in the sense that you would be afraid of me, but for you to feel safe that it's okay to lean on me. For you to feel safe that it's okay to trust in me. For you to feel safe that when I say this is the right choice, you're going to say, yes, God, this is the right choice. And we don't doubt it. We don't question it. This is why I choose wisdom. I lean into God's knowledge and understanding. I live by it, I trust it, and it leads me to what is truly life. Wisdom doesn't guarantee us an easy life. Wisdom doesn't guarantee you an easy life. That is not why we choose wisdom. You see, you can make every right decision in your life, every single one, but it doesn't alter the course of the storm. The storm will still go through wherever the storm goes through. So you may have made every right choice in your life and you can still lose your home or you can still lose a job or you can still lose possessions. But at the end of the day, you still hold what? Life. You still hold life. Wisdom teaches us how to face life, whatever comes our way. Not to be overpowered by our limitations, but to move freely in God's will. To not be let down by the uncertainty, but to be joyful for the certainties that God has already revealed. God loves me. God will take care of me. And what he says will be right and will lead me to life. In that same portion, the teacher concludes in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 1. This is what it says. It says, who is wise? It's a rhetorical question, right? And who knows the meaning of anything? A person's wisdom brightens the expression. It changes the hardness of someone's face. It won't always change the circumstances around us. Making the right choice is not going to change the world around you all the time. Making the wise choice is not going to fix every problem around you. But it will change us. It will change our heart. It will change our posture. It will change our character. It will change our worldview that we may continue to fear God, to seek the joy of life that we get to live. 
it will continue to shape us to lean into God and not run away from him, to trust what he says, to continue to follow what he says. So yeah, I choose wisdom. Not because I want to fix everything around me. I choose wisdom because when I come to God in fear and in reverence, where he points is always going to lead to light and is always going to lead to a better me. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord God, because you, at the end of all this, you promise that if we ask for wisdom, Lord God, that you would pour wisdom into our lives generously. Because at the end of the day, Father, you're a God who wants us to lean on you, to depend on you, to fear you, to trust you, not to be afraid of you, not to run away from you, not to doubt you, not to be skeptical about you or your will. You have proven we would truly listen and make those choices that leads us closer to truly what is light. We thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together that we trust in God. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail, I trust in God, my Savior. Amen. Amen. We cannot wait to celebrate with you next Sunday as we also celebrate baptism, but we also can't wait to celebrate with you this week as we get together to do community. Let me bless you as we pray. Heavenly Father, we make over 30,000 choices every day. It's a lot. And we need your wisdom. And I pray, Father, that you would gift us your wisdom and pour it lavishly into our lives, that we would continue to make choices that honor you, that glorify you, and that bring us life. And I pray, Father, that as we go forth and as we seek you and as we seek to be with you, Lord God, I pray that you would come near to us, Lord. I pray that you would bless as we work as we spend time with family lord that our lives would be rich with the relationships that you have surrounded us with lord and i pray for good health and uh, your protection over us in our coming and in our going lord we pray all these blessings in the name of jesus amen you are dismissed <laughs>